You are listening to Pools Podcast, an extension of the Emergence Creative Space. This week, my guest is a self-described global citizen. He is deeply passionate about finding and implementing the tools that can help improve our communities and our world. He's a published author, accomplished touring musician, and has deep roots in the conscious festival culture, where he honed his skills that now help him achieve success. He's an advocate of continuous improvement and learning as much as he can from his time here on the planet. In this episode, I get a chance to sit down with Alicia Israel to hear his secret formula on how he inspires conscious creation in his friends, his business partners, and himself. Professionally, Alicia is the founder and CEO of AliciaIsrael.com and is a direct response advertiser. His company has generated millions in sales for his clients. I hope you get as much out of our conversation as I did. Thanks for listening to Portal's podcast. You can find this episode and more at www.emergentcreativespace.com. All right, let's get inspired. You're listening to Portal's podcast, an extension of the Emergence Creative Space. Listeners are transported into the hearts and minds of some of the most inspired creators, producers, artists, and activists around. Portals is a platform and a spotlight on people, organizations, businesses, and more who are the unsung heroes making a huge impact on the lives of others. My name is Scott Love, and I will be your host on this journey into the powerful world of intention and conscious creation. I am an activist, an entrepreneur, and a visionary. Over the years, I've made some incredible relationships with a lot of truly epic people. Many have helped inspire me and have guided me on my journey. I believe they'll help you as well. Here's what's up. We are a people in transition. The choices we make now will affect lives for generations to come. Our choices will be our legacy. I want Pearl's podcast to be a go-to resource for those who are searching for solutions and to help us move this all forward. Thanks for being here. All right, let's get inspired. All right, and welcome to this, the sixth episode of Portal's podcast, brought to you by Emergence Creative Space. My name is Scott Love, and today I have the pleasure of sitting down and having a conversation with Alicia Israel. It's a pleasure because, first of all, I haven't seen this bro, my bud, in a couple of years. We've chatted here and there on the socials, but it's been a minute. I went up to back up to Detroit area, Ann Arbor actually, and you had you hit the the West Coast, been touring the West Coast, been doing all sorts of great things. And how you doing, man? I'm doing really well. I'm doing really well. And thank you for having me. Oh man, my pleasure, my pleasure. I like that. Is that a map or is that a three piece painting in the background? Yeah, it's. I got this place furnished, so I don't have any claim on it. Oh, nice. But, <laughs> but at the same time, it is really nice. People have been commenting on it a lot. That's really cool. Yeah. Goodness. For those who are listening, there's a, it looks like an atlas of the world in three panels, um, three large panels. It's like an art piece and looks like the bodies of land are gold in color. It just looks really sweet. A few different shades too. Like it's, some parts of it are a little bit more shaded than others. So it gives it a, some nice texture and depth and makes certain parts of it pop up a little bit more. That's great. You know, you know what's been blowing my mind? Like during this whole pandemic thing, I've had so much time to just investigate all my curiosities. Everything yeah. from ancient civilizations to the roots of words to all sorts of other things. But one of the things that I've really gotten into has been the evolution of the map and how going back, going back in time and looking at how the maps look says a lot about where civilization was at that time. You know? 100%. And you can learn a lot from the way that they view the world around them, the way, like what they valued, what they were choosing to identify. Uh, you probably spent more time on that than I have, but even just thinking about it conceptually, I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, actually, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> okay, what about this? What about the fact that there are maps that go back hundreds of years that are based on maps that are hundreds of years before that, that have Antarctica on them. Oh, wow. But we didn't know about Antarctica until what, 1800s? I did not know that. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yeah. There are maps that show islands in the Atlantic that are now 300 feet underwater. Really? So which, which says that there were people around making maps or right. at least telling stories that ended oh, up on maps. these maps yeah. 
of land masses that were 300 feet underneath the water. So then they have to go back and say, okay, when was the water 300 feet lower? Oh, right. 10,000 years ago? What? <laughs> 10,000 years ago, we were supposed to be just putting pieces right. of wood together to make fire. There was crazy. some, I think if you look at some of the Pacific Islander nations, uh, I think like uh, there definitely was like the Maori and some of those people have a very long history of long distance seafaring. I don't know the exact year of it, but they actually were able to, to go immense distances. They had these pontoon style boats and they would just have all of them like lined up with section and then like a raft in the middle with like yeah and weren't and they weren't just, they weren't they made of reeds? I I, I don't know. That's I don't nuts, know. man. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> Imagine being out at sea. Like I just I go out to water whenever it happened to be near the ocean. Like and I like the times that I do get in the water, I just get beat up by the waves. I'm like, yeah. I don't know how people do this. Imagine just being out there. And out in the ocean, man, you don't know when a storm is coming up. Yeah. I mean it's like can you imagine being out there in a little vessel and there's like 10, 12, 20 foot waves around you, storm, rain pouring down on you. That's crazy. That's not, that's those people had balls. Yeah. Seriously, uh, seriously. That's crazy. They did it. Yeah. Uh, woo, but they did. There's no doubt yeah. about it. They did, <laughs> you know, and how about this? Take that one step further. There are tribes in South America that have DNA that can only be found in these Polynesian islands you're talking about that are in the South Pacific. And yeah, <laughs> another one of the things I've been really, really into is studying deep history of humanity. And there, there's one isolated tribe or one isolated region in South America, nowhere else in South America, just this one area that has DNA that matches New Zealand or Polynesia, right. somewhere like yeah. that. Okay. And just crazy. That means that they must have traveled all the way across. Right, the right. How they came from Siberia. They did that for sure. Right. Right. That's yeah. not the only way they did it, man. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, uh, I believe that there have been many civilizations. I don't know about many. But over the millions of years that this planet's been evolving or has been hospitable, uh, you know, I, I would not be surprised if somehow they found out that, oh, throughout the history of this planet, there has been 15 species that have gotten to as far as humanity is now and maybe even beyond. But we wouldn't know because the Earth kind of churns in on itself and constantly recreates its surface. I, I don't. I don't have those answers. No, I don't know. It's something I love thinking about. I love thinking about yeah. that, man. It's a you fun know? concept. It's definitely a fun concept. But yeah, you know, I I just wanted to to shout you out real quick. You know, when I moved to Asheville, I was 22 years old at the time. I didn't really know much of anything, and I knew that I wanted to go there because the music scene was better there than in my hometown. And I was recommended to connect with you and, and some other some other people down there because you were organizing an event. I had some experience with events in Michigan. Some mutual friends were like, hey, you should go talk to these guys. And then, you know, you were you were kind enough to invite me into your community to to invite me to support you on the event that you were working. And then over the next three years, we worked together on those events and were able to really help create a really incredible space and support a ton of artists and a ton of creatives and really make a ton of connections through that community, many of which I still hold today. So I just wanted to start by saying thank you to you because there are there are those moments when strangers take a flyer on you and you definitely, definitely considering the context, like I think at a certain point towards the beginning, I may have been living out of my car and you definitely took a, a pretty solid flyer on me and gave me an opportunity to, to earn my way and I really appreciated that. Wow, thank you, man. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Um... I don't know what to say. I, I, I love you, man. Yeah, of I course. You. And you you lit a fire under my ass, too. Because here's the flip side of that is I had to act like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> right? <laughs> I had to impress upon you that I'm not just some jokester out here. It worked. Yeah, it was, but we did some good work, dude. Every yeah, every year we worked together. That. You know, we had our we had our moments, our, our ram Ram my moments. communication skills were absolutely horrible in my and my point. patience was so little <laughs> so yeah it was yeah. good maybe we'll get a chance to do it again sometime 
Let's see. I, there's definitely, an, I think there's an interesting gap in the market for like a, a hybrid event that's a mix of both the, and I don't really see it being at a festival site. I think maybe it's more at like a conference center or something like that. Uh, but it's a mix of really high quality music, arts, creatives, workshops, but also bringing in tech, bringing in business development, kind of on like the South by Southwest mold. But I think like looking at a, like a hyper concentrated three day like space, I think there's a really interesting opportunity there because it becomes like a hip place to be at simply because you're going to have a lot of people from a lot of different communities kind of intersecting and bringing right. in the business community will, will allow for there to be a, a pretty solid, you know, mix of, you know, not only just going to, to have fun and kick it with friends and see cool art, but also being able to educate and, and learn new skills and, you know, making sure obviously that they're well curated, there's nothing scammy there, but making sure that there's also the opportunity for people to potentially take another step in their life if they are so inclined. Right. You know, I, I feel like with the festival that we worked on together as well as some of the other festivals that we were both either working on or affiliated with in some ways. The the thing that I always loved was the workshop element during the day and being able to have that for me, like I probably didn't even participate nearly in as many as many other people did, but it was really nice to actually be able to, to know that these were not only just, oh, we're here to party, but there was also a space where we could learn and potentially, you know, and I just kind of want to see that like concept go beyond just like, you know, personal care as well as like life skills which is kind of where it was focused on and go beyond that and bring in you know business leaders and bringing in community leaders and activists and having the hard conversations and very curated spaces you know i think I love there's it. a lot of I love it. stuff like yeah. that that can happen at the, like in, as the next evolution of of events but it's going to be a while before that one happens <laughs> yeah well you know they just came out with a 15 minute test you know, we can we can do an event where uh, people show up and they get show up knowing that they're going to be tested. And when they get I'm there, not doing any. I'm not doing anything in the event space nowadays. So I no, will, no. As well, I mean, as far as I'm thinking, because um, I've been thinking about 3DL. We were going to do a 2020 3DL. Uh, I had a bigger team than I ever had before, and there was more support going in than ever before, and it was really exciting. And I think it's because well, I know it's because. Everybody knew that it was a fundraiser. Everybody knew that it was to help raise money to take care of artists and co-creators that I wasn't able to meet at the level that I told them I would meet them at financially during the event. And so that was really exciting. And it was crazy because there was people that I thought were really angry at me. Right. And so, but at the point is that most of it was heart to heart. It was, it was people that I knew, people that, right. yeah, that, that, that trusted that me. Like the biggest. You'll get, Scott, you'll get that sorted out in no time. I have, I have zero concerns about that. You know, the thing that interesting is that, and maybe this is an, an interesting space to take the conversation and kind of pivot from there. Um, whether it's somebody who, who may be in a position where they have a little bit of debt and they're looking to potentially sort it out. Uh, maybe it's somebody who's just younger and curious <laughs> and trying to, to find to find their way. The thing that to me is interesting is that, you know, obviously nowadays there's a lot of really challenging narratives, challenging realities that people are facing. And we're living in a time where there's a lot of uh, discontent, there's a lot of confusion, there's a lot of divisiveness and poor communication across the board. And the thing that is really interesting to me is within that, there is a lot of opportunity to create solutions for the problems that many of us agree exist. The thing that to me is interesting is people aren't necessarily aware of what's going on. Like in the, we're in the middle of the build out of an entirely new grid. It's already happening. People act like something like the Green New Deal hasn't started. No, like we hit, we hit those efficiency numbers in terms of costs like years ago. So people act like the renewable future is something that is like, oh man, like we got to, uh, like we missed it. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, it's already being built. Right. Now, obviously, you have some bigger organizations that are very resistant to those kinds of things. And that's, but even still, I mean, you look at a company like Exxon was re recently removed from their stock index. They have been the biggest company on that index. A lot of opportunity is moving around. There's a lot of 
infrastructure that's being built and rebuilt through the private industry. And I think through the private sector. And I think that what's really important is that what, you know, when you're looking at the different problems that are occurring, you know, we can actually take an, a view of like, okay, yes, this is a problem that's occurring and then stop the conversation. Or we can go ahead and say, this is a problem that's occurring. Let's see how we can support them. And, you know, at the end of the day, there are people who they, they don't realize what the fundamental nature of a, a transaction is or, you know, what a business is. And I think they get this really negative perception that is fully justified, you know, fully justified. If you look at like what people think of when they think of big business or they think of business as a whole, they think of some guy in a suit who's ripping people off and underpaying his staff. Right. Sales. It's all sales. Yeah. It's all sales and snake oil. Sure. Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, you know, and th there's a lot of animosity around that for good reason. I mean, look, over the past few years, I've been exposed to touching on sales for a quick example. I've been exposed to a lot of different styles of selling. And the thing that is really interesting to me is that there are the entire narrative that people have around selling, for example, is based on this like Wolf of Wall Street, like in your face, like we're going to get it and, and, you know, trap people in a corner, bully them into a sale kind of situation. But that stuff does exist. That does stuff exist. hundred percent. hundred percent. I worked and when I was. I'm not going to name names, but I will say that for the people who, if you think those are those people, then you are a hundred percent right. Check it out, dude. There are other ways to do things, but I want to, sorry, go ahead. No, dude, you're good. Uh, I remember when I was in my twenties, maybe my early thirties, for those who don't know me, I'm a 50 now. I just turned 50. Um, but when I was in my twenties, I worked, there was a store in the mall and I can't even remember the name of it, but our gig was, we were selling timeshares to retired folks. Yeah. I was there for about three weeks. I was yeah. miserable <laughs> and I kept working because I was living with this girl and I, and I, I just wanted to make money. And she's like, baby, listen, it's eating you alive. Don't do it. So yeah. I quit. Yeah. Then I quit. And then right after I quit, they went out of business. I heard they got in trouble. So yeah. good for them. I'm glad I and, wasn't there. You know, there's that side of it. There's that side of the business world. And I think everybody is aware of it and it's justifiable. There's the side of the business world that's big business that's, you know, they're taking every single tax deduction. They're not paying their taxes. They're, you know, destroying the planet. They're, you know, all of those are justified conversations. Consume, 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 consume. But the question is actually not a matter of consume, 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 because the fact of the matter is we as humanity are going to naturally consume. So if we accept that we are going to naturally consume, we then look at what are we consuming? What are the conscious that consumption? Are... Yes, exactly. How are the systems designed for this consumption? Are we actually making sure that we have ethical supply chains, that we are prioritizing the things in our supply chains that are actually um, aligned with yes. the greater vision of the planet? Now, you can do this from a regulatory perspective, and, you know, I wish we would be more advanced than we are in the U.S. than that, but than, we're, than we are right now. But the thing is, there's also a lot of opportunity. You mean you right can, now as in the last three years up to the current date, or you mean like now as in where we are as a culture, period? No, that's well, a trap. Don't answer it. Don't answer it. It's no, a trap. Well, I, I will say that in the past three to four years, we this country, this administration specifically, um, and, you know, this is recorded in 2020, right before the U.S. election. So if people yep. do listen to this later. They have that context. What, what if this was the only time capsule someone found like 50,000 <laughs> years from now is this recording? Sure. You know, well, the thing is, you know, there has been a lot of uh, rollbacks over the past few years in this previous administration or in this administration, hopefully previous fingers crossed. So there's been a lot of rollbacks, uh, environmental protections and uh, you know, water protections. There has been a lot of actually rollbacks of uh, the federal holdings on protected lands. And then the next week they'll announce that they suddenly protected half of the amount, but it's framed as we're protecting 500 million acres. Well, you just unprotected the other half of that. Right, <laughs> right. Of it, and so you reprotected half of it to get a headline. Oh, like, it's so, it's so, so weird. It's a shell game. Yeah. It's all a giant yeah, shell game. Yeah, hundred percent. Anyways, moving beyond that, but you look at, for example, they were looking at cutting EV tax credits. They allowed the the solar Let's tax. Say EV. Incentives. Yeah, like electric vehicles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 2019, they didn't. Maybe. They didn't cancel it. Um, I would. I would have to double check that. I do know that it was in the budget proposal to cut it. 
Um, I believe that it was, uh, let me check actually, I got my computer right here. That's cool. In the meantime, everyone who's watching this can see me dance. <laughs> there you go. And if those of you who can't see me dance, you can listen yeah, to me. Yeah, I home. think it ended. <laughs> it's either considerably reduced in terms of the, the credits or it was it was a phased renewal. So as of this recording, I'm just not 100% sure without spending more time on it where exactly that phase out was at, but I do believe it was either, it was ended or very close to it. Uh, the the solar tax credit was allowed to step down. It was scheduled to step down, but they did still allow it to step down from 30% to 26%. At the end of this year, it's gonna step down to 22% if it's not extended. And that- What does that, that mean? Was, what is that? What is that? So if you're a homeowner who buys solar, you can get a 30% tax credit. So even though you may pay through it for it through financing or through cash, you if you have the tax liability, then you can just deduct that 30% either over the first year or over the next few years. Oh, so you can just deduct what you paid towards electricity. So let's say you let's say you spent thirty thousand, then you would get a ten thousand dollar credit. If I spent thirty grand on the electrical, on the solar, I'm getting your solar system installed okay. in your house. Okay, and what then are in these... theory, if it's done right, then your bills will be ideally significantly cheaper than they were. And you've been working in this area for a minute, right? I've I've built a lot of relationships in the solar space. Yes, yeah, that's awesome. That that's freaking awesome. I know people that are getting into oil and natural gas, and I think, I think what you're first. doing is really cool. Thank you. You think that's yeah. what? I think getting into oil and natural gas is a poor career choice. The economics yeah. are over. It's not, it's not a conversation. It's not a debate. It's simple math at this point, you know, especially when you start to look at the, we already had a massive, a massive decline in costs for the manufacturing. Uh, we already hit the, the law of large numbers with the manufacturing of, uh, and, you know, just the numbers of scale. With but the United States is producing more oil than any other country in the world. And we are now off the dependency of Saudi Arabia's teat. <laughs> yeah, but the question is, like, do we need oil or can we actually... I mean, obviously, like, oil is going to be one of the tricky ones. All it's we be need the one... is sunshine and marijuana. No, well, oil is actually going to be the trickiest one to phase out because natural gas can be replaced with the combination of a uh, mix of renewables and energy storage. Like hemp oil? Hemp oil is interesting. It could be used for biofuels. I you think, see, that's uh, what I'm saying. All we need is sunshine and marijuana. Uh, potentially. I mean, there is there's a great case for airplanes in the future to actually not be battery ran and for them to be to be done exclusively through biofuels since their emissions would still be reduced so much. It, the, the cost and also like the weight of having battery packs on planes could be very challenging from an engineering perspective. Did Again, you see the, the words, new batteries? Kind of Which ones? The new batteries that Elon Musk just unveiled. The power walls? The next generation auto EVs. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know that they had a battery day a little bit ago and that's kind of zooming out from just Tesla because they're not the only company in the space. Right, the, right, right. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, using that as a reference to how yeah. battery technology is exploding. In ten years, it's going to be crazy. These well, these questions we have about solar cell or about cells and and holding energy, it, it's it's going to be like where we are now is going to be like the Stone Ages compared to where we're going to be in just ten years. Solar technology hasn't changed in fifty years. It's the batteries that are the innovation. We've made solar panels more efficient. We we've, we've made more efficient processes. We've taken them from you know maybe like originally maybe seven to 10% efficiency. Now they're all the way up to, you know, some of the best commer or commercially available ones are around 23%, give or take a little bit. But the, the, the thing that's really interesting is, so we had this massive decline in the cost of solar, right, roughly from like 2012 up until about 2017. And it's stabilized pretty much since then. Now we're at the top of that right now with batteries. So, and the more that we're able to manufacture them, the more gigafactories get built, the more factories Sonnen actually gets firing up, the more factories LG gets firing up for batteries, you know, Panasonic as well. The more, like, I don't care who does it. I just want yeah, to Yeah, there's lots, of, lots yeah. of companies out there doing it, and not so, just Tesla. Yeah, 100%. And so that's the thing that's really, really interesting when you look at this rollout of this technology. And then, the, you know, someone might say, oh, well, like, 
battery, you know, lithium ion batteries only last so long. Well, what are you going to do for long distance energy or long term energy storage? And that's where, you know, I had a conversation with a friend. This is coming specifically from him. He's a smart guy. I'm just going to kind of relay what he shared with me. That is where you have pumped hydro storage. And so you have these massive facilities. You can actually turn a mine into, into a pumped hydro facility where basically you're just pumping the water up and down, up and down. And that will actually allow you to store energy as well as remove energy. And so hydro, you have like hydro, like water? Hydro. Okay. So basically what you do is you create a pump mechanism that brings the water up and allows it to release. So you'll have like a big basin of water, almost like a dam. Okay. But then you're just basically bringing the water up and releasing it. So if you base, if you need to remove energy, you just pump the pump the water. But you can also store it in in there as well. I, I again, I'm not an expert on this in any way, shape, or form. That's that's awesome. But that's very very cool. Now, what isn't that what the Hoover Dam is, or is it something different than like damming lakes? So so a pumped hydro storage facility is not necessarily going to function as a dam, and it wouldn't necessarily be an area where there was a body of water that we wanted to stop and then extract energy from the way that we do with dams. Okay. What, we, what we would be basically doing is we would find something like an out of commission mine and filling it with water and just using using relatively straightforward machinery to continually cycle that water through. Almost think maybe like a windmill. Okay. The way that a windmill creates energy. So you would just have some sort of mechanism that was rotating the water through your machines and that simple act of moving the water through will allow the uh, energy to, to cr get created when it rushes back down. Okay. And uh, it's a natural cycle that moves the fan. There's no energy that makes it run. There may be some here. Let me, let me not be an idiot. All right. Okay. <laughs> Pump storage hydroelectricity is a type of hydro. I'm reading off Wikipedia right now is a type of hydroelectric energy storage used by electric power systems for load balancing. Load balancing is basically making sure that you always have enough available power for the grid. Okay. So you need to, you know, if you're in, an, in a, you know, wind and solar kind of energy economy, you need to have somewhere to put the excess power. Okay. Let's see. So the method stores energy in the form of gravitational potential energy of water pumped from a lower elevation re reservoir to a higher elevation. So low, sur low cost surplus off peak electric power is typically used to run the pumps. So you do need a little bit of electricity coming from a provider to, okay. to run the pumps, but the simple act of pumping the water through will create energy on its own. Cool. And then they're able to sell it during times that are needed. So if the grid is needed, they just, you know, anyways. It's awesome. Um, it's, it's, some, it's a simple solution that makes sense. And actually, you know, again, I'm sharing the, uh, I'm sharing everything that I'm sharing in this kind of section is actually shared from this gentleman, Michael. But the, the thing that is actually really interesting about it is because you specifically can do it in abandoned mines. And the way my, the way my friend described it was he was talking about how there are, there are people who are different kinds of people. You have water people, they're on the ocean their whole lives. I'm not really that kind of person. I was like, oh, right. I don't know how people do it, right? And then you have people who are it's people pretty and i'll go visit it but i don't want to live right, right there 100 percent, right and then you have people who are people of the earth you know you have you have people who culturally generationally have come from mining families they've come from people who have worked in the mountains these are yeah. people who know this land so it's a natural next step for them to actually build out these facilities in the appalachian mountains that's what i was gonna so say where we met where mine. we met there's a shitload of mines empty yeah. abandoned dangerous yeah, and those can just be turned into these water reservoirs that have a, a relatively simple mechanism. You know, they're going to need some fine tuning and, out, you know, getting it all built out. Built out will take probably about 10 years if we started today. But we can actually build out this whole entire system. It's the largest form of grid storage that we have right now. It's very simple. It's proven science. It's already it's stuff we know how to do. And so... You know, there, there's some interesting things that I see. People are, like, concerned about, like, oh, well, like, batteries aren't going to last for long enough. And it's like, well, batteries are short-term storage, and then we have long-term storage. And this is the primary ideal solution. So the thing that I want to really impress on people is, you know, I'm right now jamming on renewables because it's a topic that I love, and I love being able to share it. But the, you can do this in any industry. Like, you or, or, or anybody who's listening 
can do this in any industry. It's just a matter of identifying where are those opportunities. And granted, that last segment was just from a conversation. So I can't even say that that is my own intelligence speaking through. That is somebody much smarter. It's something that excites you. Yeah. Yeah, Um, it's something you want to find more out about. It's where you are right now. But the thing is, you know, there are, there are opportunities like that in every single industry where we have systems that are broken. You know, for example, our electrical system right now, it works okay, but the fact of the matter is it is built on um, systems that are destructive to the planet. And so in order, and we have the opportunity to create a fully closed regenerative system. It's just a simple yes, it, like it's not even a yes, no, it's just a simple right. decision. This makes more sense. This is more cost efficient. This needs less repairs. This extracts less. We damage the planet less. <laughs> this just freaks me out. It's like, yeah, I, I mean, I've always thought, I, I, I can't remember who explained it to me like this. It was back when I was younger. It was either my, one of my cousins or a friend or maybe one of my friend's parents. It took millions and millions of years for that oil to become what it is. And that is like the lubricant of the earth. It like it's like these pockets of lubricant, and it helps things move. When the more we suck it up, the 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 harder it is for these tectonics and these things to yeah. shift. And they Even have though more there's volatile interactions. And so I've always thought like if the earth, I've always thought of the earth as like a living being, you know, like 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 we're living beings. I think of the earth as like a living being, and all of it, all all of it encompassed. And it's like, we're like the fleas on the earth's skin, sucking the blood out as we're sucking the oil out of the earth. I think that's one way to look at it. But I also think that we still have an opportunity to, to create sustainable and regenerative societies. Oh, absolutely. I absolutely. I think, I think we're conscious fleas. We can make yeah. choices now. Yeah. And I think, you know, let's even just taking something as simple as food waste. There's so many simple solutions that can be done in the food supply chain, whether it's just making sure that the right excess products get sent over to the right space and then they go to the food bank. A lot of that is already happening, but also with, with products, you know, why are we not actually saying, okay, we have this whole entire bin of apples that didn't sell. There's, you know, they're not great. Well, why aren't we selling these to another company that can then process it into apple juice because you know they might be bruised but people will still when you're looking at regenerative society every puzzle piece connects to that next puzzle piece and so i really encourage people to to whatever it is just find something that interests you that engages you and is intriguing to you and from there just look at it and ask yourself what are the problems in this space and how can i create a solution that is of enough value that somebody would be willing to pay me for it now Obviously, it's not all about getting paid. That is just means that it is something that has been validated as an opportunity. People are happy to let go of their money when they have a problem that they want solved. And if they believe that the person can genuinely help them get from that transformation, then if it is of enough importance to them, enough value to them, or solves a big enough problem, then the money becomes a non-issue. That's the thing that a lot of people don't necessarily realize because they look at these businesses, like you can name any business, but I'm going to go with the worst of them all. I'm going to go with Amazon. You can, you can go forever on how a company like Amazon is not a great company. And if you talk about their worker ethics, if you talk about their task driver mentality, if you talk about the, the way that they don't allow their workers to have the level of protections that are needed, those are all justified conversations. And I want to preface what I'm going to say next with that. Because when you actually look at what Amazon does as a logistics entity, the amount of supplies they are able to move around in society, that is of incredible value. Do you think Amazon is an evil company? No, I think they don't care about their employees. Okay, uh, someone close to me just started working at Amazon. And this is why it's kind of important to me. Um, Tell me why you think that is. Because their worker protections aren't great. They're... they're, um, amount of pressure they put onto their employees isn't great. The, the amount of um, limited um, basic benefits in the workday or just overall as an employee that they provide are really challenging. The, the What is the national that, minimum wage right now? Do you know? Um, the national minimum wage, I believe is seven twenty five. I don't know if, I, I don't know exactly what Amazon yeah, cool. pays. $15 an hour is Guaranteed? what I think. 
I think that's the midnight shift is fifteen dollars an hour. I think it's a couple dollars less if you're okay. not the midnight shift. Yeah. But they also have this weird thing. It's called flexible scheduling, where if yeah. you're scheduled for eight hours and you want to leave at six, you can leave at six. It's weird, dude. Never yeah. heard of such a thing. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, they definitely, you know, the the raising of their wages was a, a recent thing. But you can, there's still, you know, enough there. You know, there's some questionable stuff about the way they've hired and treated um, immigrant workers. Yeah. No, so, dude, I, I'm hip. So, I just wanted to hear you say it. Yeah, but but like going bringing it back to the to the point that I was kind of tapping on is like for as much as you can have a justified conversation about how they're maybe an unethical company or maybe they're not necessarily uh, a company that uh, treats their workers right, and that's a fair conversation to have for a company of that size or really of any company. When you look at their logistics platform, when you look at what they do online with AWS, you know, which hosts Netflix, they have Pentagon contracts. Like, the, this is a company that does actually provide essential services to the economy. And so, when you look at stuff like their valuation, a lot of people say, oh no, like people should stop buying through Amazon. But like, they were the one who got stuff there, the essential supplies, you know, during COVID. So like you can say like for all of the things and you can talk about how it's not good for small business, but then you have the other side of it with their FBA platform, where if somebody can save up a couple thousand dollars and, and buy a pallet, they can send it off to Amazon. Amazon will sell it for them. You know, if you put it in the right listing that already has traffic, it'll get so I don't understand Amazon. Amazon at all. I really don't. Well, what I'm, well, the it's point fucking mind is, blowing to me. It's like this, this entity that's outside. It's a lot of, of third party system. sellers. Amazon is mainly a, uh, is mainly a logistics and company that has a, a web platform for third party sellers. Okay. They do have some of their own brand stuff, but if I wanted to sell something on Amazon, I could do that. If I wanted to buy a pallet of product and send it to Amazon and put it onto a high traffic listing, if I buy toilet paper and I put it onto the toilet paper listing, and every 10th time somebody buys a roll of toilet paper, my toilet paper sells, I completely forget about it. Amazon takes 30%, and if you pick the right products and margins, that can be a very healthy business. And there's a lot of people who have become millionaires from Amazon, actually, specifically through that specific service. So like, the thing that I really wanna encourage people is when you look at something, look at it with nuance. And I wanna bring it back, because like, this whole Amazon distraction, I think it's important because I think it's important for us, for people to, I think, I think the thing that is really important and, you know, when we look at some of the things that get, get people frustrated about a company like Amazon, the thing that's really important is to ask yourself, is that the kind of person, is that the kind of business that I want to run? So once you start looking at, okay, we've, we've identified a problem. We found the way that we're able to validate it, that it's a big enough problem that people are willing to actually take their hard earned money and actually pay for it to be solved. Well, you know that there's actually a real problem there that's being solved. It's not about the money. It's about the fact that we get right. to solve the problem. The money is just simply a way to make sure we take care of the people. And you know what, sometimes maybe a little bit that more than that, and I'm okay with that too, you know, as long as people pay their taxes. <laughs> right. But like the thing is, um, the thing that for me, is, is interesting is how much opportunity there is because it just has to be a real problem. Why do plumbers exist? Plumbers exist because somebody's toilet gets stuck. Right. And somebody needs to come through and people don't have whatever it is in their house, not just their toilet, but people don't have the skill set or the interest or the time. Or the Any tools. Those, what was that? Or the tools. Or the tools, sure. For any of those four reasons, they would rather have somebody come and do it. Is it a difficult thing? I mean, obviously some parts of it could be, maybe, maybe not, but it's just the fact that there are people who are uninterested in doing it. Same thing with roofing a house, same thing with your windows, same thing with potentially something like a marketing service, same thing with, you know, potentially helping people with research or helping people with admin or helping people with sales or operations or fulfillment or you know, shipping, whatever it is, you know, you know, a guy who has an e-commerce company, the best question you can ask them is, Hey man, are you shipping out everything yourself? If you want a job and you know, somebody who runs out e-commerce, ask them that because they'll, you'll find out exactly how terrible their life is pretty quickly. If they have a lot of sales coming through and they're doing all the shipping themselves. I don't, I mean, obviously they're making good money, but they're also completely stressed, completely all over the place. 
constantly shipping stuff out, constantly packing, constantly creating. I have a little bit of experience with packing and with selling and shipping. And just before Christmas of 2010, I issued uh, like six different designs I put on social media as being for sale for hoodies and t-shirts to help me raise money to create the very first event I ever did called the 11, 11, 11 gathering. And so I put these t-shirts up just before Christmas. I forgot about it. I ended up between Christmas and new year going to my mom's house and spending time with my mom and hanging out with my family. And then coming back around the third of January to just about $2,000 in t-shirt sales on my, wow. like it already paid for it. <laughs> like they paid for and it. And then you realize what you had to do, right? And so I had to go to the print store <laughs> and print fucking t-shirts that cost me, first of all, way too much money. Right. I, I said it was okay because it was a local business. Right. But I still think I got I paid way too much. That's and then I had and then I had to it's take care of shipping. That's a good thing. Then I had to pack it up. Yeah. You know? And then I wrote little handwritten notes and it was yeah. it was it was a but man, holy shit. So much more than I thought it was gonna be. Yeah, exactly. So and if somebody's doing that at scale, then they're always going to need help. So like, these are things when you like, I think a lot of people just don't spend time thinking about how does something actually practically work? What is the process that goes into how whatever the thing is actually works? Right. And when you start to think about that, you can actually start to identify these are where the thing is falling apart. This is where the stress point is. And the thing that's really interesting to me is there are what I would call common problems and then maybe what I would call big problems. The, the services that we all use all the time, it's your, your, your plumber, it's your window person. These are stuff, you know, they make a great living, they do amazing work, they help a ton of people, but it's the stuff that, you know, just kind of keeps everything going. It's the stuff that keeps society moving. Then from there is the next set, which is, okay, let's look at maybe a broader issue. Now, I, I know uh, some, people who are in the women's empowerment space. These are, these are women leaders, they lead communities, they're very wonderful people. For them, their problem is that they feel like so many women are disempowered by society. They feel like a lot of these people aren't necessarily given opportunities through the workspace or underpaid, and also are in a situation where oftentimes when they go into the business world, they are, if for themselves, they are undervalued and don't have the tools or skill sets to really have a sense of identity, to really maybe stand their ground or communicate what it is that they are looking to communicate. So that's a broad problem, which is, you know, the overall disempowerment of women in society. Okay. Then they build programs that help women build the business, that help women, you know, figure out what it is that they love to do, that help women become financially free, that help. That is when it gets interesting. When you start with an interesting problem, when you start with the big problem and you say, this is something that is something that we can accept as true in society. This is where that big issue is. Now, how can we actually solve it through private, private industry? And so that to me is something that's really interesting because it's us actually taking responsibility for the reality that we live in. And I think it's so easy in highly politicized times to really abstract it all out. And those conversations need to happen and they need to happen in the public arena. And we need to see who are and aren't good faith actors in debate. And we need to understand the other side as well across the spectrum. We need to be willing to understand and listen while also recognizing that not everybody is willing to understand and listen. And so that's an unfortunate balancing act. But in our personal work and the things that we do day in and day out, for us, it's about asking, what are the big problems that we care about solving? What are the things that we actually look to and we're like, this is something that actually matters, that actually helps people. How can we, whether it's through our first step, you know, like the first business that you build, or maybe through the second step, maybe you build a business just to get the funding for the big idea. You know, these are things to me that are really, really interesting. You know, that's where you build a boring business that works and it's right. easy to run, you right. know, potentially leverage for something future but anyways i just think there's a lot of really interesting things and i, I want to really encourage people who are creatively oriented to start maybe leaning into identifying some of the things that either going around directly in your area or on the broader level of society that are things that you're interested in passionate about and start having conversations about people with people who are, who are directly experiencing the perceived problem and confirm that it's happening and see if they'd be interested in the solution. All right. Well, well, yeah. We're going to take a quick break. Uh -huh. And sure. then, um, not to interrupt you, because you're on a roll there, bro. 
We're going to take a little break here. And when we come back, I want you to answer how somebody who's sitting at home right now who has an idea can kick that idea up to the point where it's actually a project. Yeah. All right, cool. You're listening to Portals Podcast, an extension of Emergence Creative Space. You can find this podcast and many others at emergencecreativespace.com. We'll be right back after this short break. This is Emergence Creative Space news and announcements. The 2020 3DL Vision Gathering has been postponed until 2021. Those of you who have reserved your RSVP light support tickets, those tickets will still be honored when we release tickets. The RSVP light supporters get half off their ticketing price when they are released. For those of you who are interested in becoming light support ticket holders, you can do so by registering at www.2020visiongathering.com. In other news, we're very happy to announce that the Portals podcast format is growing. Starting next week, our next episode, we'll be introducing a brand new segment called Spotlight on the Arts. Here we're going to get to know some of our favorite poets, musicians, spoken word artists, storytellers a little better. Really looking forward to this. I'm very happy to announce the success of our very first Emergence Creative Space newsletter, which was sent out a few weeks ago. If you're interested in receiving news and updates through your email on all things happening related to Portal's podcast, Emergence Creative Space, or Three Days of Light, simply head to www.emergencecreativespace.com. Once there, just find the free subscription or free membership buttons. All right, that just about does it for news and updates for this issue. If you would like to have your news and information added to the Portals Podcast news and updates format, just simply get in touch with us, and we'll see what we can do about including your information. All right, if you're listening to this, then chances are you like podcasts. And there's also a good chance that you've thought about creating your own podcast. Well, I'll tell you what, it's really easy. Well, Anchor has made it easy. Um, it's free. There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so you don't have to go through any third parties or spend hours a week trying to get your stuff uploaded. And you can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and there's a whole slew of others. And what's really sweet about Anchor that a lot of others don't provide you is that you can start making money with your podcast just about right away with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need a podcast to be in one place. And what I really like about it is that you can create your podcast right from your page without having to do it anywhere else. So download the Anchor app or go to anchorfm.com. All right, here's to being inspired. Welcome back to Portal's Podcast, an extension of the Emergence Creative Space. If you would like to support Emergence Creative Space and help us continue these podcasts, please visit patreon.com forward slash Emergence Creative Space. And now, back to the show. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Portal's Podcast. An extension of the Emergence Creative Space. My name is Scott Love. I am with my guest, Alicia Israel. I see that you're on this path and you're on this journey and you're on this becoming whatever it is you're going to turn out to be. It's been good to watch. Yeah. So for those of you who are just tuning in, although this is a podcast, I don't know if people tune in to podcasts in the middle of a podcast. I don't think they do. Well, for those Probably of you, we'll see. No, maybe, maybe, whatever, this is all new to me. Maybe they skip forward. Yeah, accidentally hit it right there at that moment. Yeah, of course. It landed. All scroll right. Scroll through it and they're like, oh, interesting. I heard some guitar. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about the, the trepidation that people feel when it comes to the business world and the, the fact that people don't really need to be afraid of the quote unquote business world because business creates an economy. An economy, like when I think of the word currency, I think, I think of current, like the energy that chugs something along, whether it's energy or whether it's the oceans. The current is what propels things. And we were just getting into ways that people can invest their energy into this current currency. 
and the current currency is shifting. It's like the source of the energy is shifting from uh, fossil fuels and the ideas of greed. And we're becoming more conscious as a community of how the things we do impact the world around us. We talked about shifting from non-renewables to renewables. And then we just started talking briefly about how we can help to make the sustainable movement move. We left off, we were talking about how people can invest their energy into these movements. And that, that brought up a question for me. And that was, how does someone sitting at home who isn't necessarily tapped in, isn't necessarily sitting with a network 3,000 strong, or hasn't been a part of a community up to now, they want to, how does that person feel confident that they have the intuitive resources or the energetic resources within themselves to make such an investment. Yes. So you said something really interesting that I want to touch on first. And then from there, I'll share a quick resource that would be really helpful. And I'll walk people through the process. Cool. The first thing that you said was you talked about how when you hear the word currency, you think of the word current. And I can think of just to double down on that. I think many people don't necessarily have clarity on what currency or money is representative of. And so I just kind of wanted to share from me, from my perspective, money is simply the vehicle of trust. And so when somebody is trusted to do something, they're given either compensated and rewarded for it based upon the level of trust and authority and expertise, et cetera, that they bring to what it is that they're doing. So somebody who has an extensive career of project management is trusted with bigger projects which therefore have maybe better margins or higher risk and therefore they're compensated higher. The, the thing that I want re people to really understand is that one of the fastest things that you can do, well, maybe not fast because trust is really earned, especially with people that don't know you. One of the things that I would really prioritize is just energetically recognizing that if you want to be somebody that is of impact, one of the elements is being a trusted person. And that means that you have to have a demonstrable body of work that allows for people to see this person has done this, this they've done this. One of my ambitions in the future is to create a hybrid of like a sustainability consulting and sustainability venture capital firm, something that kind of works in the middle. Now, the way a lot of venture capital firms work is they don't actually use their own money. They simply have enough trust with lenders or with people who are able to provide funds, maybe investors rather than lenders, people who are actually taking an ownership stake of a company with their money rather than people who are just lending it to get more money back. And so oftentimes they just have trust built with those people. So usually an investing team is going to have due diligence. They're going to have a process to follow to make sure something is valid but they'll be willing to listen because it's coming from a trusted source. So when you're looking at wanting to build towards bigger projects, just think of yourself as working towards building your trust in society, not on an individual like level, like a self-worth level, like, oh man, like, should I trust myself or do my friends trust me, et cetera, like, not like that, but just, you know, professionally with what you do, with what it is that you bring to the table, you know, you do what you're going to say stability. you're going to do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Reliability, stability, those are the energetics, support, you know, being able to provide that in whatever capacity that you're working in is going to pay dividends over the course of a career. Now let's get a little bit more technical because maybe that's an energetic answer, but I really do want to make sure that people have an actual path towards being able to go from, I have no idea what I want to do to figuring out how to actually get there. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mention a book. It's called The Lean Startup. It's by this guy, Eric Reese. It's E-R-I-C-R-E-I-S. And so the book is called The Lean Startup. You can get it at your local bookstore or, you know, your preferred online vendor. You can even get a, a summary from Blinkist that will summarize the book for you. And I'll get into the book a little bit later. But the thing that, that I would really encourage is to, one, get some exposure to that book. Even if you could find a summary online, it would be a good idea. I'll go over it as well. The reason why I don't want to go over it right now is because most of that is once you have the idea, the general direction of the idea, then what do you do? So I'll walk you through that. But I think the first thing that I want to touch on is how do we find the general direction of the idea? Um, and I'm going to zoom out actually way out. There's this concept from Japan called Ikigai. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the diagram, but it's basically like a Venn diagram, but it's got way more parameters in it. It's got way more circles. 
it generally sits within four main categories. You have what you're good at, what you love, what the world needs, and what you can be paid for. Now, you can break this down with a piece of paper and a pen. What you're able to do is you're actually able to just create columns just on a pen, maybe sideways, maybe upside down, doesn't really matter. Just create some columns with those four things. And no judgment, nobody, like for you as a listener, this is your own journey to discover with yourself. You never have to show this paper to anybody. So be Right, honest. right. I like right. it. I like it. Yeah. So, you know, first column, what you're good at. Second column, what you love, what you really enjoy doing. Number three, what you feel the world needs. And then number four, what you can be paid for, what you have been paid for, or maybe skills that you would be interested in developing to reach that. Now, when you're able to actually get that written out in front of you, you're going to see something really, really interesting. If that one gets you stuck, there's another way that you can do this. You can do the same thing with a piece of paper and a pen, and you can create your columns, and you can have your columns being everything I've ever gotten paid for. Even if it's like just mowing a lawn, or if it's we're working on an event and you got 20 bucks at the end of the night for helping out, write it all out. It doesn't matter. Again, this is, this is for just the individual who's doing this. Then from there, you can actually write what you're interested in. Again, the skills that you'd be interested in. And again, at this point, you're really maybe listing out some of the different like ranges of skills and interests that you have broadly. You wouldn't even actually be choosing. You would just kind of go really broad and just write everything out. And then from there, if you wanted to, if you went with this much broader list, if you just wanted to like brain fart everything that you can think of, you can just then go and start start to cross out and circle things. Cross out the things that you don't like that you've done in your life and circle things that you, and again, you'll see it very clearly in front of you. And from there, you can start to then look at, okay, well, if this is my foundation, and yes, there's maybe skill development, there may be new things I learned, you know, for me, I hadn't ran Facebook ads four years ago, and now I run a business built on that. And I'm very grateful that I'm able to do that. But that wasn't something that I thought of, you know, six years ago that was going to be a business. In fact, Scott, you remember my response to to marketing. Yeah. Like, the irony, like I'm, I'm fully aware of it. I've made jokes about it, actually. I've been like, oh, man, like I even told my friend that I hated marketing, and now I run marketing. There's a lot that I've learned to appreciate and a lot that you taught me about, about ways to think. But the thing that also really interesting was I didn't necessarily know where the those skills were going to go. So just allow yourself the opportunity to kind of explore those things that kind of you, that you end up seeing on those pieces of paper. The one with the things that you love, what you feel the world needs, what you what you've been paid for, what you could be paid for, what skills you could develop, as well as what you're good at. And being able to just sit down and write all of that out. And you can even write out what you enjoy doing. It doesn't necessarily need to be, it doesn't need to be a like a a job-based thing. Like if you really enjoy something, definitely include it and just look at the map that you just made in front of you and start to, to make informed decisions rather than just having it all jumbled in our head. That's great. That's great. What better time than in the middle of a stay-at-home pandemic? A hundred percent. That's amazing. So the, the thing that is from there, you'll kind of get your direction. You'll kind of understand like this is the broad level direction that I'm looking to go in. And then from there, the next step is asking yourself, who is it that I'm actually interested in supporting? It's not about going to them with, this is my thing. And this is where a book like The Lean Startup gets really, really helpful. Because what, is it, what it does is it walks through the process of creating an MVP, a minimum viable product. Now, what you do is you go to those people that you have identified as your potentially most ideal customers, and you start to just have conversations with them. You pay attention to what they're reading. You pay attention to okay, they like to hang out on these Reddit threads. Well, let, let me just pay attention to that. You start to understand the language of what they're using and what their day-to-day -day experience is like. You're almost being a researcher is a better way of saying it. And then from there, through those direct conversations is going to be the best, the single best thing that you can do is have those direct conversations with those people and just ask them, what is it that you're looking to accomplish related to, let's say they're in this specific industry. So related to, I'm going to go broad, let's say somebody's in real estate, you want to help realtors, it's like, what are you looking to accomplish in real estate in the next three to six months? And they'll tell you, they'll be happy to tell you. Then you'll say, okay, well, what's in the way of you being able to reach that? And they'll tell you all the problems that they're experiencing. And suddenly with that, you just have a ton of juice to build an offer out of. You have 20 of those conversations, you'll know that industry pretty well. Right. And then from there, when they've told you your problems, you can identify them. 
you can prioritize them, you can recognize which are the highest value, and that might be an iterative process over the course of your business, and then you can solve that, those problems for them. And then at that point, you just simply go back and be like, hey, well, I know you told me you had these problems. What if I had a solution? I'm just starting out. So like, I'm not going to charge you anything crazy, but would you be interested in like a, a really reduced rate in exchange for a testimonial once it works? Well, you ask enough people, 20 is kind of the magic number on that initial survey. You're going to get some sales if it's, if you follow that process, because you're not, you're not shooting blind. You're not trying to figure it all out. You're going to the people that you want to help. And you're saying, what do you need help? And, and then you just give it to them. And if it's a big enough problem for them, then they'd happily pay for it. And from there, you've suddenly, when you combine that with a sense of like social, social drive, social ethics, and the things that you actually want to address within society, you can combine that and, and have that be something where you use that as a vehicle to drive forward that change that you're looking for. How so, do people anyway. find these people? How do you find somebody that you want, that you might want to work with? the easiest answer I could give you is Facebook groups. Okay. I mean, obviously there's way more ways to do it, but if you're, if you're on a budget and you want to connect with your industry, Facebook groups are probably the best way. Most industries have some kind of presence in Facebook groups. Right. And so if you're interested in working with chiropractors and just go find a Facebook group, that's about chiropractors and just hang out there. It doesn't necessarily have to be business related or industry related. If somebody feels in their heart that there is a quote unquote seen need for anything in the community, if you want to get involved with making a solution for that or being a part of the solution and, yeah. and take the, those same techniques that you just mentioned, like, listen, it doesn't necessarily have to be a business. It could be a group. It could be a nonprofit. It could be any yeah. type of organization. Nice. Yeah. And then one thing that I also wanted to to touch on. So, like, my first instinct was like, right now, Facebook groups is probably the best way. I'm not too active in them, but if you're just getting started out, I also don't buy anything. You're gonna get pitched a lot. Like, if you're just in this part of your business, just go through this iterative process and get your sales and actually learn how things work before you buy them. A personal recommendation. Um, so maybe don't buy anything for your like first year in business, unless it's like maybe essential software for your business or something like that. But like if you see people selling programs, like you won't necessarily know what a good or bad program is until you've been in the market for a while. The one thing that I also want to say is like my first instinct was Facebook groups, but the, the correct answer is, is where your audience already hangs out. Right. So the fact is, if you're looking to reach gamers, Facebook groups might not be the best place. That might be a really active Discord channel. That might be a Reddit channel. That might be a Twitch stream. So it's really much more about where they're already hanging out rather right. than getting really stuck on like a lot of people are like, oh, well, you go to the golf clubs to, to find high value high end buyers or whatever and to play golf with them. What if your buyers are actually middle class administrative people? who shop at the local Starbucks and never go to the golf club, but you just thought you were supposed to go to the golf club, you right. know? So it's just a matter of, as you get to know your market, you start to pay attention to these things. Okay, what if somebody who's at home has this idea of something that they want to do and they want to create a business or an organization or whatever, and they want to follow these tactics, these directions that you're providing, but just don't have the time for it because they're raising kids or they're, the manage they're managing a household is there like do you offer these services to people so i do not currently offer coaching and consulting okay this time i don't offer that what i do offer is advertising services online if people are looking for help with getting in touch with their ideal clients and they already have a business that's validated they right. already have an offer that's sold then at that point i'm able to step in but that's why i create space and like to come to spaces like this where i can have these conversations and have them in, in some way in the public forum, because that is something that I think is really important when you're looking at who are the people who are actively going out there and, and reaching communities to, to bring them up. You know, that's part of what we're all here to do, in, in my opinion, and I want to do that as much as possible. And so I just wanted to say thank you for, for being willing to have me on here. If people do have any questions, if they want to get in touch with me, uh, they, they can go to my website. It's www.aliciaisrael.com. That's B-L-I-S-H-A-I-S-R-A-E-L dot com. And yeah, I mean, you'll be able to, to get some free resources there. To, if you're interested in growing your business, if you're interested in getting some ideas or some blogs, et cetera, you'll be able to find a lot of information. This is awesome, man. 
I like that you're giving people tips on how to get off the ground, get motivated. You're not offering a sales pitch. And then when, when people do get to a certain level of their development and they want help with advertising or marketing, you're the go-to guy. I am one of many people who are in the space that are, there are a lot of really great people in the space. And um, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've been able to, to have the time. I remember when I, so Scott, as you know, when I left Asheville, I moved across the country. I moved to Eugene, Oregon, and I was torn there. You know, I, I my first house was some hilarious dude who, you know, didn't work out because he, I rented, a, there were three rooms and I rented a room and then Apparently the other room had been rented and then suddenly it was rented again. And then suddenly he was renting out his master room because he wanted to sleep in the living room and rent out the master room. It was just a con show. The whole thing was a con show. Was he just trying to get out of paying rent at all? Uh, yeah, basically. And okay. he also had like a girlfriend and kids and an ex-girlfriend or ex-wife. It was, there was, it was a pretty messy thing. So I was there for like three weeks and then I was like, nah, I'm out. This isn't, this out. isn't right. And so when I left Asheville and then got to Eugene, I was really torn on whether or not I wanted to get a job or start a business. And so the thing for me that was really helped that decision was I had a conversation with this lady that I know and she asked me, and this is the puzzle piece I missed before when I walked through that concept of Ikigai. She asked me what my core values were. And these are the things that are most important to me in my life. And obviously family was on the list. And the other real major one that really stood out was time flexibility. Because as a creative, I know that when I have time flexibility, I end up creating interesting things. And so what I did was I just went ahead and started to look at this question from that lens. It was like, do I trade my time at a job that will pay me okay, I'll make okay money, but I'll lose all of that time. Unfortunately, blessed to, ha to know the value of time because I lost my brother when he was 20 and I was only 16 at the time. And so that has always been a very strong reminder for me of how quickly everything can go away. That when I was looking at that decision, when I was looking at the question of, do I trade my time or do I take that time flexibility as a creative and trust that I can figure it out? I decided to go ahead and make that choice and it was the best, one of the best decisions I've ever made. The next part that I really want to dive into is that I understand that I was coming from a position of privilege. I was young. I had a little bit of money. I had people that I could call for a hundred bucks on a rainy day. I didn't have any responsibilities. I didn't have kids, any dogs, any wife. I didn't have a mortgage. I didn't have any of those. I had a $485 a month bill for rent. Okay. Right. That was it. And maybe at the time it was like $50 for health insurance because Oregon was nice at the time. And so the thing that is really interesting that is important is, and this is something that I heard a friend say, and it's something that I really, really loved. And it was a great reframe. A lot of people get really, really frustrated with their job. And let's say somebody is making 25 K 50 K a year, whatever they're making. There's actually, instead of being frustrated with your job, if you are somewhat entrepreneurial or creative, look at it as a free investment into your creative endeavors. If you're making 25K a year, that's 25K a year into your projects. Even just from the fact that it's able to pay your bills, that means your energy is able to be directed to that. Right. 50K a year, whatever it is, that's an investment into what it is that you're doing. So, you know, definitely approach it with a sense of gratitude and honor the fact that, yeah, sure, you might be working 40 hours a week. You might be maybe even working more than that. But if you can give yourself the grace of 30 minutes a day, incredible things can happen. You know, the cheesy, cheesy meme thing, 1% every day is three, 365% growth over the course of a year. Right. It's not really how growth works, but it's really helpful to, to frame it for people on a broader level. That reminds me of the Pat Riley method of coaching. Okay, so Pat Riley was an NBA coach back in the day that coached the Lakers and he's, I think he's the, like Heat. The, the Miami Heat right now who are about to be in the finals. Right. The story goes, when he walks into an owner's office, and I might be elaborating, it's, I've told the story many times mm -hmm. since I've read it. So when he walks into an owner's office and he's interviewing for a job, he says, I will, I guarantee that I will make your team improve 100%. As a minimum, 100%. Yeah. They hire him, Pat Riley. But yeah. what he does is he creates these charts. He creates 100 charts, and he gets the team to improve 1% in each one of these charts. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm and saying? His teams have always been great. 
And his teams have always been great. Whether it's time from the, the catch to the release. The team free throw percentage goes up by 1%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, their shot percentage goes up by 1%. Their and defense steals go up by 1%. Yes, man. And it, it works. And if they go up 2%, then his team has improved 200% or 3%. Yeah. And, yeah, man. So it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, that, that's what your story reminded me of. Yeah, and it's really just a matter of consistency, and I think that's the element that a lot of people are missing out on. And, you know, I think people have, like, this flawed idea of consistency. I mean, the ideal of consistency is you do the thing every single day, and you stick to it, you know, people who does those animated things, and it's done them for years straight. Yes, that's the ideal. It's okay to, to recognize that we can look at consistency in the span of years as well. You know, when we're building a body of work, sometimes it's okay to have that rest day. Sometimes it's okay to, you know, watch that video, but just make sure that you're consistently over time, giving yourself the gift and grace of time for what it is that you are looking to build in the world. Because right. the, the world is so anxious to see whatever bursts out of that. And I promise you, everybody is, is really excited about it. Go for it. <laughs> nice, nice. Yes. Go for it. You know, it's kind of like professional sports. We were just we were just on the sports analogy, so I can go with uh, Pat Riley. Yeah, but I love basketball. It's not it's not like they're the the professional athletes are churning out 100 percent physical all the time, 365 days. No, they they have time off, and then they build back up to that point. But they build back up to that point. It's not like they had time off and then bam, they're playing pro games again. Yeah. They have training. And they have warm-ups and they have all these things, these scrimmages, getting ready for that point. And then the season begins. And then even the season is a warm-up for the playoffs. And even the playoffs are a warm-up for the championship. And it's like you're constantly learning, constantly. But to be on 100% of the time. That's why, like, these bands that are touring all the fucking time it's not blow my mind, dude. How? How yeah. do you tour three years in a row? Yeah. What? Yeah, it's it, that's a tough life. Uh, you know, I, I've done some of it, and, you know, I'll, completely, I'll be completely transparent. It's not the easiest thing, especially with what many of those bands get paid. Yeah, you know, I think also for bands, you know, they should definitely be looking at, at brand building online because they'll have a lot of opportunities as they grow an audience to sell to that audience. So I definitely recommend that they, you know, do everything they can to really spend time and energy, just really identifying like the emotional character right. of, of their identity and really building that community online. And it's definitely something I would highly encourage for any, any musicians listening. So yeah, maybe, maybe I can bridge over to music a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to sure. talk about music or I like um, music? Do you like music? Yeah, I like I love music. I've been right. I've been working on music for a long time. So I just kind of music's a good thing. It is. It's great. I've got a music project. It's called the Yalu, D A Y A L U. It's a Sanskrit word. It means uh, variations of kind and sympathetic and some other some other definitions in that space. A few years ago, when I when I left Asheville, I just got to Eugene and made a ton of music and it all kind of sucked but it was all like conceptually good but just the mix downs and the audio quality of it all kind of sucked and so the music you made in Nashville was good yeah but it all sucked like the music it all I made sucked. In Nashville, well like technically from like an audio engineering perspective yeah I, don't, I, don't, really I never pay out. attention to that well that's not true I, I know if there's a shitty recording going on I've always liked your music Thank you. The music lifestyle you did well, including including the making of the music, performing the music, talking about the music, hanging out with other musicians, booking yourself as an artist, all that shit you did pretty well. For an independent artist yeah, who was just getting started, you fucking dedicated yourself to it and you played shows. Yeah. You created tours. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it was good stuff. Thank you did you, that well, that's all that. I'm saying. Thank you. I appreciate that. That means yes. a lot. I don't think I had enough people tell me that at the time. <laughs> the, uh, we kind of touched on it right there. I got to Eugene, just kind of was in a room working on my business, working on a bunch of music. And over the past couple of years, I've traveled a lot. And really just while I was traveling, I knew I wasn't going to be doing a lot of composition. So I just really focused on like the audio engineering side of my music and would just work on the same two or three songs over and over and over again and just tighten up the mix down. And then a month later, 
pull out my computer and maybe I've had it on SoundCloud for that month and listening to it randomly on a bus or while I'm walking down the street or while I'm going to sleep or whatever it is, just hearing it in different settings and just allowing myself to really hear and then also getting feedback from some people that I have a lot of respect for and really allowing myself to just to really gain a much more nuanced understanding of what was happening within those two or three songs. And from there was really able to tighten it up. So now I'm in the position where I've been able to really fine tune a lot of that. And now I have this whole library of 15 to 20 songs that I made from back then, as well as a couple of small new things that I'm just kind of sitting on that I just need to go ahead and work through and sort through, really finish up all the mix downs for them. So I'm really excited. But the reason why this triggered me is because we were talking about like before how I mentioned with musicians, it's important to figure out the emotional identity of yeah. what your music wants to be. And the reason that, that I shared that was because that's coming really from what I'm aiming to do with my own project. You know, the, the goal that I really want to provide with this specific music project is I want to provide a space of serenity. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to be completely peaceful and bland and meditation music the whole entire time or even much of the time. But the thing that what I really want to do is I want people to have an experience of serenity. So when I'm bringing people in like some to to basically have these videos that are just nature stills, like a sunset that I took, a time lapse of a sunset. And just have like a little icon, turn the sound on, new song from, you know, from Dialu. And then they can just turn the sound on and get 30 seconds of serenity with some, with some music in the background. And then, nice. you know, that, that for me is something where I, I want to use this vehicle of this music to actively go out and, and bring it to the people that, that need it. And so that's something to me that's really, really exciting. It's really, really encouraging that I'm looking forward to. What's, think, what's the time frame until we can hear this music, man? Um, well, I would say that as of right now, I've got about two or three of the mixes done. Yeah. So if you go to twitch.com or sorry, twitch.tv slash Dialu music, and that's D-A-Y-A-L-U music. What I've been doing is I've actually been live streaming these mix sessions. And I actually just had my dad ship me my old mic. I've got a little stand in the mouth in the mouth. So I'll have like actually pretty decent audio to be able to explain everything that I'm doing. So if people are interested, you know, this is going to be something going on over the next month or two after this podcast comes out. Is there I'll a actually, day? I'm, I'm probably going to start streaming it over onto my personal social media as well. How but people, basically, where, do people, where do people find that? Uh, so I would say they can just look me up on social media platforms, uh, whichever whichever one is their preferred one. Yeah, just just look up my name and you should be able to find me. Your, your, your given name or your music name? Yeah, I would say just look up Diallo, Diallo Music on Facebook. And so same thing with Twitch. I'll just be basically streaming and sharing my entire thought process as I go through all the mix downs of these songs. Each song will be over the course of one to two sessions. Sweet. And then after that, all of them will be released in a series of EPs. Where Diallo. Be... Diallo. Yes. Diallo. It's like, it, I think it's like Diallo, though. I would Diallo. Say. Yeah, it's like like the flat A, like da, D A, like da Yalu. Da Yalu. Da Yalu. Nice. Yeah, I I don't know. I, I mean, I'm excited for this project. It's one that I've kind of backburnered for a long time, but the foundation has been set and the intention has been set for a long time. Nice. And um, I'm really excited to to just kind of continue to allow it to mature. I'm so curious. I love California. Yeah. It does a lot of weird shit going on in California right now. A lot of people in California are leaving California. It's a lot of houses in California selling too. Yeah, it's because everyone's leaving. Too. They're, they're sell the people are moving in? Yeah, there's a lot of people moving to California. Okay. You moved to San Diego. I did. How long have you been there? I've been in San Diego for about uh, six months now. Nice, nice. What do you like about it? I just, I really feel it's the the perfect American city. I mean, it's beautiful. It's right on the water. You know, obviously, if you go a little bit north, you have a lot, a bunch of smaller towns that are really beautiful that are worth checking out. The uh, the city itself, it's both big enough and small enough, and the obviously the the weather is great, the climate is great, and I'm I'm pretty happy to be here right now. I've actually kind of got stuck here in, due to COVID. I you know I just wanted to check San Diego out because it I was thinking to myself, it made sense that this might be where I wanted to raise a family down the road. Okay. So I was just coming here, checked out LA for a month. I was in 
I was in Venice for a month and then I hung out with some friends in Vegas. One of my clients is there. They have a marketing agency and I helped them out with their stuff. Was there for three weeks. And then from there, I went to San Diego and that was end of February and then March. And then suddenly I wasn't going anywhere. April, May, my, June, July, August, September. Yeah, and then my, my grandma's 93 and she, or she's about to be 93 and she moved in with my dad. And I'm just more active than either of them would be. So it, it doesn't make complete sense for me to go there to be right. with them right now just because it would could actually put them at risk but yeah uh life is good san diego is a beautiful area and nice. you know, I, I highly you, recommend people come visit if you had a chance to get out and check out the sight and sounds of it yeah i mean definitely definitely some and you know more is definitely on the way i don't have a car here right now my car's back in Michigan and there's no point in me bringing it out here. On, <laughs> excuse me. I honestly don't think it would make it across the country. 2001 Buick Century with probably 260,000 miles on it plus. So, um, I just got a uh, 2005 Mountaineer premium package. It's a nice Badass car. fucking whip. I love it. Nice. It was, uh, I paid like next to nothing for it, but it's got 250,000 miles on it. I, honestly, it's not a bad. If the car is well maintained, it can go. Yeah, for a while. it was one owner. The owner lived in West Bloomfield. It was oh, one well, owner for yeah. like since he Eon. bought it brand new, <laughs> and it was just yeah, sick. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I drove it down to Asheville and back. Crazy thing happened, uh, and I should have known better because the brakes were squishy. But uh, I drove it down to Asheville, helped uh, my buddy Misha do the Earth Dance thing. That was cool. Had a good time. Uh, Pick came back, and when I got to Knoxville, my brakes just started grinding like fuck. Oh. That was like at nine o'clock. I just drove seventy-five on cruise control the whole time. Yeah, I, I, it took me. I took my time getting there. I was it took me fourteen hours from Ann Arbor to Asheville. I think it took me eleven and a half to get back. Yeah, it's actually a pretty chill drive. It's yeah, it's I like pretty it. Chill. I like it. Yeah. Misha did a good job with Earth Dance, and I'm excited to see what he's going to do next. Although he didn't really do Earth Dance, he did the Earth Dance Asheville, which was kind of cool. Was, what I really wanted to find out was how to do a virtual online festival. And I'm not sure I learned any of that, but I had a good time. I, I don't know too much about that. I know that there are, are people who are doing it, stuff like that in Minecraft and some of those like online virtual communities like Second Life and stuff like that. Yep. But I um, I really, you know, even with some VR stuff, I know that there are people who are organizing events in VR and whatnot. When I stayed there, I hung out with my friend Julia and this guy Alex Mengel. And Engel, Alex... I've known for a while. Uh, we did an event together back in 2013. But he's got this really cool virtual reality video game interactive festival experience that he's like 90% ready to release. And it is dope. I saw it. I played it. I looked on the headphones. It is like sweet. And he can do custom experiences. It's just so cool. Uh, yeah, I, they're probably, so close. Yeah, that, that's that's impressive. Uh, it's something I don't know much about, but yeah. You know, Me, I didn't know anything about it either, but I'm too excited. Yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking about doing a New Year's Eve virtual experience, but there's a lot more conversation that has to be had before I decide yeah. yes or no on that. All right, brother. Well, thank you so much for uh, hanging out tonight. Where can people find you on social media? Yeah, I mean, I would say if people just go to my website, if they go to www.aliciaisreal.com, they'd be able to find all the links to follow me from there. And if they wanted to potentially stream or download my music, they could go to dayalu.bandcamp.com or look up Dayalu Music on Facebook or Instagram. And they would be able to, you know, on Facebook, they'll be able to get some of those live streams that I was talking about as well. Very good, brother. Good to talk to you. And I hope we do this again soon. Yeah, of course. And thank you for having me. Yes, brother. Adios, man. Well, that concludes yet another episode of Portals Podcast, brought to you by Emergence Creative Space. Once again, thank you so much for being here. 
Your presence and energy bring so much to this. Without you, there is no Portals Podcast. If you're interested in finding ways that you can help support Emergence Creative Space or a Portals Podcast, please check out our website at www.emergencecreativespace.com or you can find our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Emergence Creative Space. All right, thank you so much. Bless. And remember, there really is no better time to be good to yourself and to reach out to the people that you love and let them know that you love them. All right.